So the next, our next speaker is uh, Charles de la Cruz. So Charles is a uh, pulmonology slash intensivist uh, here at Yale. Uh, he's part of the team that developed the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, diagnostic testing uh, test uh, using a saliva. So Charles, the floor is yours. Charles, I'm yeah, yeah, can you hear me? yeah, good. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for inv inviting me to uh pr present uh to the PASA group, uh, and uh, congratulations on your anniversary. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about um saliva specifically and diagnostic testing for SARS CoV 2. Uh, you just heard uh, in a nice talk by Dr. Salvana. Uh, how uh, Philippines is doing with regards to cases and death. Uh, this is updated uh, this week. Unfortunately, in the United States, um, our numbers um, are incredibly high. Uh, and then globally, uh, we all know what's going on with this pandemic. Uh, very early in the pandemic, uh, early January, the sequence for SARS-CoV-2 um, was um, identified and listed here. Uh, and some of these are the viral genes, the N genes, the E genes, the spike uh, uh, genes where the receptor bindings is quite important, uh, have been sequenced. Uh, this uh, plays into a role in, importantly because of, uh, of diagnostics. Um, and in terms of diagnostic currently for COVID-19, uh, we can think of it at the different phases of the disease um, from screening a symptomatic patient to monitoring contacts, uh, to identifying patients who are symptomatic when they come into the hospital for diagnosis, and then later on uh, for whether or not, how do we de-isolate and monitor uh, for uh, shedding uh, in, in the convalescent phase. Um, diagnostic testing can also come in many different flavors um, with regards to, for example, antibody testing uh, in the blood uh, for IgM, IgG antibodies using the rapid tests or ELISA testing. Um, but that won't be the major focus of this uh, talk. Uh, I'm going to be talking specifically more about uh, PCR testing uh, using nasopharyngeal swabs uh, and then how that compares with saliva uh, in the detection of viral um, RNA. And this has become sort of the gold standard in diagnostic testing because it sort of detects, uh, it, it's rapid. It detects the viral presence. Um, I mean, in the olden days, I think you would do viral cultures to see that you actually li have live viruses. But given um, the, the need for diagnostic testing, uh, these are more uh, sort of molecular these days. Uh, these tend to be labor intensive. There's a lot of reagents, specialized equipment required, uh, and then potentially sampling error. Um, specifically, for example, uh, for molecular testing, uh, you would require the specimen collection, RNA extraction, deactivating the virus, finding a place where you can do this safely. And then you have the results of the test based on cycle threshold, as you can see on the bottom right. Um, and the lower the number, the higher likelihood uh, of the viral load in, in, in your patients. Um, and then the 40 cycle threshold typically are the cutoff uh, to be anything less than 40. Uh, most patient, most uh, labs find it to be positive. Um, and then um, the lower the number, the higher the viral load. And you can see in the middle bottom here, um, you know, the, for example, in this one, they use e-genes. The, uh, the n-gene is used in many of the diagnostic testing. Uh, other genes like the RNA-dependent uh, RNA polymerase gene has, are used for confirmatory. Uh, and, um, and others uh, are also using, for example, um, RNA-sp, for example, uh, as a gene uh, to measure host uh, uh, the patient sample uh, as, a, as a control. And then you have a machine like this, for example, to do the PCR. Uh, in the detection of, um, you know, respiratory pathogen, for example, you have the nasal pharyngeal swab, you know, I don't know if you have had it done, uh, and most of the time it's quite uncomfortable and irritating and, and spin the gold standard currently. Other people have tried oral pharyngeal swab, which tends to be more tolerable. Uh, it still has its irritation and uh, at least in the CDC, the recommendation currently has been still the, the use of nasopharyngeal swab. Uh, and then there's some thoughts about using other um, samples, for example, sputum, uh, uh, endotracheal aspirates, VAL samples, for example, patients who are intubated. Um, so what's the connection between positivity and PCR and viral culture? Uh, and then very briefly, 
in the upper left, you can see that the higher the copy numbers, the more likely you're going to get positive cultures. Um, in addition, um, in the bottom here, um, the days after onset of symptoms, um, as you heard earlier, the, the less likelihood you can get positivity on the RNA. And then this goes along with the positivity and the positive viral culture. Uh, in this in this publication here, you can see uh, these positive culture in open circle tend to have lower cycle threshold, which um, which goes along with um, with um, higher viral load, more likely in a PCR to get positive culture. And what's interesting is that the pre-symptomatic patients, at least in this small number here, um, they uh, have low cycle threshold, but then also you get to have positivity, which um, sort of highlights the importance of these pre-symptomatic symptomatic patients uh, to be highly contagious and transmittable of their disease. And, and that's why social distancing and masks are really important in the control of this virus. So then why, why is uh, saliva important? Um, you know, it's, uh, you can collect all the oral fluids. Um, it's been done in other detecting other viruses, for example, including coronavirus uh, with fairly good concordance. Uh, it's quite efficient in screening. Um, People can use it uh, in the absence of airborne isolation, for example, and healthcare workers um, are not necessarily required. You can ask the patient to do this. It's very simple to do. Uh, eliminates the wait time for the specimen collection, uh, and, uh, and it's actually for, quite good for serial viral load monitoring uh, because it's less uh, uncomfortable. And so I think it's a great idea to explore the possibility of using saliva. Um, other studies have shown um, that, for example, you could detect saliva uh, in self-collection in, in this small number of patients. And you can see the numbers here over time of hospitalization um, sort of a tend towards um, a decrease in numbers. Um, you know, you have one patient here uh, that actually goes to zero and goes up again. And those tend to be, you know, sometimes you're concerned about sort of false negative, right? Uh, and so I think you try to look for those kind of patterns uh, and, and you can see uh, positivity in, in most of these patients. So in uh, Yale, uh, in the Beginning and, and as as everybody else, uh, we have collected uh, positive COVID patients starting in March, uh, both in hospitalized patients who are tested positive, um, recruited a lot of their samples, uh, including sputum and saliva, uh, along with blood samples. Uh, today, I'm going to be focusing mostly on the saliva. Uh, in parallel, we were um, um, collecting samples for patients uh, for healthcare workers who are working in our ICU and sort of COVID floors as well. Uh, with high occupational risk and then um, and, and screen them for transmission. And so these um, healthcare workers uh, have self-administered NP swabs as well as sampling uh, every three days. Uh, typically these patients are asked to uh, spit into a sterile cup upon waking up. Some of the advice have been to not to eat, smoke, or do oral hygiene before 60 minutes before the collection. Uh, and so some of the early studies uh, suggested that there's actually pretty good matching of NP and saliva um, and, uh, and the positivity of these patients are around 60 to 77 percent. These include all comers, right? As patients come in at a hospital, they're all positive, and over time, the, their positivity decreases. And so, um, but you can see the concordance actually quite great, quite good. Um, uh, this work um, uh, by some of our colleagues and Wiley is currently in MedArchive uh, as a preprint. And what they saw that is this, they saw quite strong um, SARS-CoV-2 detection of saliva here in the, in the left, uh, you can see the copy numbers uh, tend to be a little higher than nasopharyngeal swab. And when they match these samples, uh, again, is they tend to be higher uh, in the nasopharyngeal swab um, um, compared to N uh, NP in the saliva. And what's interesting is the false negative rate uh, for NP swab was actually quite high, it's 124 in the match samples, whereas the false negative rate for saliva is only 12% suggesting that maybe uh, you can get the same positivity with a less negativity rate uh, for saliva if you use it for uh, testing. And so this is currently under review. Um, in the same study, um, they showed that um, the saliva, where uh, in the saliva cohort, you have negative tests, and you can see on this one sort of line here, uh, where one time is negative and the next day, uh, next several days is positive again. You see more of that in nasopharyngeal swab. And it's likely, um, possibly technique, uh, um, that uh, especially and these are um, uh, included uh, 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 subjects who are uh, self-administered a nasopharyngeal swab. And so uh, the reliability of the saliva is actually much higher. Uh, and then you can see here um, in the healthcare worker, um, 
and the left hand side, um, the saliva uh, SARS CoV 2 uh, copy numbers are actually, uh, you can see the spread. And what's interesting is that in the healthcare worker self sampling, the variance in the saliva sample is actually much, um, much better than the nasal pharyngeal. So there's big, bigger variance here uh, where um, you can see there's a lot of um, um, differences between the different time points in the, in the healthcare workers. And others have shown that the NP variability is, is actually not, uh, is actually quite uh, uh, present in, uh, in other studies. Uh, this is a study uh, from China where they look at nasal swab versus throat swabs and see that even throat swab is actually a lot worse. The detection of um, uh, CT values are actually a lot higher and they're not able to detect it where they can see in nasal swab. They didn't do any studies in saliva. Um, there's some early meta-analysis of saliva PCR testing, and uh, I listed some of these um, um, publications here. In general, the sensitivity that they reported ranges from 78% to 100%. Um, the specificity, uh, the only thing that they can say is that they had, there's one positive saliva that uh, in, in 50 negative NP swabs, uh, in another study was two positive saliva in 98, suggesting that the specificity is actually quite good. Uh, others have found um, sort of higher viral loads in NP swabs uh, versus saliva. And so I think there's more studies that need to be done to really uh, find out um, the use of saliva. Uh, some of the limitations um, have been um, most of the studies um, um, uh, are, are not focused on early in the disease course. Um, and uh, the performance in the outpatient settings, um, there's a lot of work in cur currently, even including Yale, about asymptomatic individuals and early illness and whether the use of saliva could be very helpful. Um, there's comparable study in the outpatient that, um, that looked at uh, saliva as a diagnostic. The Rutgers University has a expanded use already on 60 patients and then there's other places that are starting to use saliva. If you look at clinical.gov, uh, there's almost like 50 ongoing trials using saliva as diagnostic testing. Uh, here, I just want to uh, highlight um, the use of NP swabs, for example, um, looking at viral load. And um, one of the messages that is coming out is that the viral load um, is actually much higher in patients with se severe disease in red here. Uh, you can see even uh, 13 days after um, onset of disease compared to mild symptoms. Um, our own study, uh, and this is led by uh, one of our immunologists, uh, Dr. Iwasaki, has shown similarly uh, that uh, the severe cases in, in our ICU has more persistent higher viral load. Um, they're working now on uh, looking at the saliva to see if that could be done. Uh, so where to go next? Uh, I think the COVID outbreak uh, is continuing, unfortunately. Hopefully we have a better handle of this. Uh, it's disproportionately impacting uh, vulnerable societies. Um, you know, I think saliva potentially has an inexpensive, simple way to scale the testing that's being made available uh, in other countries. Um, and, um, and so there's a lot of exploration on this area. Um, it still requires some development. Um, there's still some risk of handling saliva samples because of the viral load. Um, there's a question about stability of the RNA in the saliva, and, uh, uh, and I'll be talking about, about antibody detection. Um, a lot of people are now working on the validation of point of care and home testing for diagnostic platforms. Um, one of the things that uh, we found is that you know, the saliva could be seen, you know, if, you, if it's fresh, you freestyle it, uh, you freestyle it in 30 degrees Celsius or, or room temperature, you can see the stability is actually quite good, um, which bodes well for its use in diagnostics. Um, some of the things that also have been developed uh, is something called the loop-mediated isothermal amplification, um, which actually is kind of interesting because it, it can detect a very low viral RNA in the sample, uh, less than 10 genome per, per microliter. Yes, uh, so this has been sort of in a preprint um, showing this handy fuge lamp uh, to detect saliva uh, virus. Uh, it doesn't require specialized equipment. Uh, they have a way of making this centrifuge. You can see this Eppendorf tube that can spin and you don't really need electricity. You can get a rapid readout uh, in one hour. Uh, it's really quite cheap uh, and, and, and a dollar. Uh, and it's a pH-based colometric assay where you can see um, the colors change from the pink to the more orange-yellow color in terms of copy numbers. Um, and then, um, and then um, and so these kind of technologies actually would allow for more rapid testing uh, and in a very cost-effective way. 
Uh, on the right and the bottom here, people are using a different technology, the nanoparticles, uh, where they could uh, see these aggregates form when there's positive viral RNA. And then when these aggregates form, they, there's a color change. So I think these are kind of pretty cool and exciting uh, um, ways of doing these diagnostic testing in the saliva. Um, at Yale, um, they're working on sort of more streamlining of this um, to try to multiplex with PCR. Uh, some are also already doing it uh, in conjunction with influenza to detect um, different viruses uh, and then uh, to validate uh, some of these in sort of asymptomatic patients. Uh, some of the considerations are, um, you know, the diagnostic needs versus research. Uh, for example, um, is this sufficient um, for detecting asymptomatic infection? Um, how do you collect these in specialized tubings? Um, and I'll show you some example. And then some of these strategies in terms of testing, uh, can you pull, pull these testing so that um, you can have sort of a small community, pull the testing, and if there's a positive, you can do more fine tuning rather than doing individual testing. Uh, so people are trying to strategize how to make it efficient so that you don't have to do a lot of testing uh, uh, if you want to know what's going on in your community. I know at Yale, they're testing sewage. Um, samples in our community to find out any positivity to get a sense in, in, the, in the sewage um, um, a material, whether there's any. A any. Uh, couple more slides. Uh, these are some examples of how to collect the, the saliva. Um, the different sort of companies that do it. Um, the Omnigenes are one of them that we're, we've been using for one of our clinical trials. Uh, in fact, some people say that even the regular sputum cup would be enough uh, because you don't need some of these. Uh, people are working on things that make it less complicated. Um, and so other things to measure, I, I talked about the virus. Uh, people are thinking about measuring antibodies, uh, maybe biomarkers like proteins. Um, just a quick, I, I don't have to go through the details. Um, there are already some studies to suggest you can actually measure these anti-spike IgA, IgM, IgG antibodies in saliva. Uh, as you can see on the right, uh, people are now correlating serum and saliva. Um, and so as a diagnostic test, uh, just to give you some flavor of what's, uh, out what's going on. So in summary, I think saliva-based diagnostic is uh, quite a promising alternative, uh, quite non-invasive, easy to collect, uh, potentially economical. Um, I think what's, what's important is that this could be used as home, in home use, self-collecting, multiple sampling, and really poss a possible real-time diagnostic, especially with the LAMP uh, technology. And so uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank some of the uh, investigators who did a lot of the uh, work on the saliva testing and some of the collaborators with this Yale Impact Team, which is uh, was formed at Yale um, to really counter uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, locally. Uh, and thank you for, for your time. Charles, thank you very much for that uh, very interesting talk. I remember like early on, uh, I was seeing some of the uh, email exchanges, the questions about saliva, and of course, the article I saw was from your group, so that's very enlightening. So uh, for those who just joined in, uh, please uh, post your questions in the group chat. We're gonna have a Q&A uh, session after, the, after this next talk. And again, I apologize for not, uh, for not being able to uh, live stream this through uh, YouTube. We had, we were having technical difficulties and you know, I, I don't know whether we can 